Yeah. Get it done already. Well, that's Shecky Goldblum. <laughs> and uh, he's in New Rochelle, New York. <laughs> he's just holding out. <laughs> he's watching reruns of the Dick Van Dyke show. That's, where, well, that's who Dick Van Dyke. From yeah, so you got to see. I'm on it, man. No, he's dead. Actually, my grandfather met Dick Van Dyke. My grandfather worked for Southern Pacific Railroad, and he was one of his most favorite actors because my grandfather loved the movie Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Right? And uh, so he uh, he says he was going on the train. There was Dick Van Dyke right there. He's the nicest man he ever met. He has a brother that he might have seen. The one who plays in Jurassic? I don't think he's in Jurassic. Jurassic. Goldblum? No, no, that's different. Oh, no, no, no. We're... we're uh, I was goofing with the Shecky thing. All right, guys, we're going to get into the scripture, okay? All right, real quick. Smyrna. Smyrna is from what? Myrrh? Bitterness? To mourn? To grieve? To uh, taste something very, very, very bitter. And do you know how you got myrrh? Like how you got the scent out of myrrh? Do you know what they used to do? You'll see in the Song of Solomon. She wears a locket around her neck. It's a leather bag. They used to carry myrrh around just to keep away bugs and mosquitoes. Did you know that? The Bedouins did that? And do you know how you activate the myrrh? What were you, you're doing this? No, on the, around the, the, the leather pouch around your, and it's between your breasts. And she even says, my beloved is like myrrh lying all night between my breasts, like my myrrh bag. So how did you, how do you activate the myrrh in that little leather pouch? Very close. You twist it until you hear it cracking. You twist it. You put it under great stress and all of a sudden what comes out? The myrrh, that aroma. So when we're talking about bitters and why the children of Israel, we'll look into numbers nine here real quick. The children of Israel, they had to have bitters. For memory's sake, like you said, bitters. But when we take bitters for medicinal purposes, Deb, you're talking about earlier, right? For what? Your liver. Anyone know what the word liver is in the Hebrew? Mar. Huh? Mar. Mar? Yeah. Liver? Oh, liver is glory. Mm -hmm. Bitter is mar. Mm -hmm. Bitter is mar. So what is the liver? Why is liver glory? It's kavad is the word, kavad. And liver, believe it or not, is the same word for the glory of God. It's glory. And so if we had a giant liver in the middle of this table, you would be saying glorious, right? No. <laughs> oh, that's a big, sticky, icky, like gooey thing. I know you would. You know, people would like but. That's a cleansing. Now, the cleansing is the thing, right? It's the it's the one heavy organ that bears all the heavy metals, all the toxins, all the poisons. It's a giant canopy that covers and protects all the vital organs, right? And is a barrier and produce, you know, and through those enzymes produces clean blood, right? What were we gonna say, Deb? That's right. So these bitters helps to activate the enzymes in the liver. But they add it to cocktails. They, they add it in order to stimulate to that. Really However, it doesn't have to be in cocktails. All right. So let's not get <laughs> so caught up in that. The like, doing yeah, they weren't doing that. They, these were not doing shots. Yeah. It just makes no sense yeah. to take it and then you just want to go drink something that's terrible yeah. for your system. That's not right. System. Well, actually, if you add bitters like wormwood to alcohol, it super toxifies the alcohol is the irony of that. So be careful because it would swirl on its own. That's why it says the drink that swirls on its own. It was actually that's what killed Alexander the Great is they put wormwood in the wine and stuff like that. It was called the Cup of Hercules, and it literally was a narcotic that you literally would go through massive hallucinations and everything else. It was a kind of a, yeah, it was serious yes. stuff. Yeah, it's serious, serious stuff. So these bitters very much activate stuff in your system, big time. Let me read this here. Healthy bitters can extremely, are extremely beneficial for what? Digestive health. 
Do we have a problem digesting the word of God? Hey, I can hear all this great stuff about God and his goodness and his forgiveness and his mercy and his long suffering. Yeah, 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 blah, 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 goody two shoes. But why are we not digesting this stuff? Really? Until we go through some pretty bitter experiences where you need God's forgiveness, you need his mercy, you need his long suffering, you need the graciousness of God. Does it not help to assimilate and to digest? Right? Because I have a problem. My body has a hard time assimilating certain nutrients. So I have to take B6, et cetera, to help my body to say, take this into your system. You could hear the word of God. You could be around it. And like Keith Green used to always say, <clears throat> you could be sitting at McDonald's, but that doesn't make you a cheeseburger. Yeah. You could be sitting in church. That doesn't make you a Christian. You could be around the word of God. That doesn't make you a child of God. You know, like that doesn't mean anything. Location means nothing. It's assimilation. Are we really being impacted by this? So whether, listen to this, digestive health and metabolism, whether your condition is infectious, which it is because we are very contagious human beings. Our attitudes are contagious, right? The things we say, the influences we have. The way we kind of touch other people's lives, right? Stress-related. How many people go to alternative ways of handling stress that are outside the word of God? Stress-related. Right? Drugs, alcohol, sex, spending, um, ego, uh, ambition, success, et cetera, et cetera. Gambling, right? There's all kinds of these things that we use, yeah, as an alternative or simply caused by exhaustion. You ever get tired and all of a sudden you're open to temptation? You ever just fatigued? You ever beat down? You just, you just don't have any more to give? Yeah, it helps you. Bitter substances can help stimulate health, health and vitality. The cause behind many of our persistent ailments. Not overcoming, persistent. It seems like we just cycle right back into it again over and over and over and over. Wow, bitterness. I think we need some bitterness. Is often the result of weakened or compromised liver function. Glory, the glory of God, right? The great toxin purifier. Bitter substances work to stimulate the liver's metabolic function and to are you ready for this to restore your body's powerful detoxifying process toxic toxic people toxic thinking toxic churches toxic fellowship toxic 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 yeah, everywhere you look today so god says to the children of israel let's go to numbers chapter 9 verses 10 and that includes you page who will be reading I'm glad. Nice, clear voice. Numbers chapter nine, part of the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch. Book number four of the five books. The fifth book is Deuteronomy. Prior to Deuteronomy is Numbers. And the book of Numbers one day, we're going to touch on that because we have to understand why Jesus during the judgment is called the wonderful numberer. And, it, and the book of Numbers is a great insight into that. So Numbers chapter nine. Verses 10 through 13. Amen. Got a good comment here. It says, uh, David Noyes says, uh, the Holy Spirit is the only way to assimilate and interpret the word of God. Everything else is an exercise of futility. Amen. 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 And you'll see that because we'll be going through Ecclesiastes. There's a lot of vanity, a lot of futility in our lives. And uh, the book of Ecclesiastes is going to tell us how to remedy that. Numbers chapter 9, verses 10 to 13. Go ahead. Did you want to share the verses? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you, Zach. Hold on. You guys, show in stream. Thank you, brother. All right. Go ahead. Speak to the children of Israel, saying, Any one of you or your posterity is unclean because of a corpse or is far away on a journey. He may still keep the Lord's pa Passover. On the 14th day of the second month, at twilight, they may keep it. They shall eat it with unleavened bread, 
and bitter herbs. They shall leave none of it until morning, nor break one of its bones. According to all the ordinances of the Passover, they shall keep it. But the man who is clean and is not on a journey and ceases to keep the Passover, that same person shall be cut off from among his people because he did not bring the offering of the Lord at its appointed time. That man shall bear his sin. Wow. Hmm. Now, why did I put all those extra verses in there? Check it out real quick. It says, if anyone of you or uh, of your, your posterity is unclean because of a corpse and is on a, or is on a faraway journey, he may still keep the Passover. So he could be unclean and be on a journey and still keep the Passover. What? What is it about you getting dirty on your journey? Why did this woman in the Song of Solomon didn't want to get up from her bed? She says, I'm clean. I don't want to defile myself. Did you know that the Pharisees did not want to defile themselves by going into Pontius Pilate on the Passover? But they had no problem crucifying Jesus Christ on the Passover. It's this weird thing. What is this defiling? The defiling, it's interesting, even the rabbi said the Song of Solomon defiles the hands. It's the holiest of all the books. It defiles the hands. How does something so holy defile you? Exposes, it shows you what's already there. Defiling you is it comes to your consciousness. You become aware of something. It's not that it wasn't there. It just becomes clear to you. So the Holy Spirit has a way of, quote, defiling you. That's the language they use. Oh, it's like a mirror has a way of what? Making you dirty. Yeah, it's already there. I was fine, like pig pen of, of uh, peanuts, right? I'm fine, right? What? what what's the problem? Right, so, and that's the whole thing. The Holy Spirit defiles you. In other words, shows you something about yourself you didn't want to see. And as long as you're on the journey and you're being shown as defiled, you keep the ass over. Who's the person that will be rejected, cut off from Israel? They're not on a journey and they're clean. Is clean on a journey ceases to keep the Passover. Yeah. Because what does the Passover do? It makes you eat bitter herbs. Mm. Right? If you go back to it, is this important? God has a way of saying, don't forget your roots. Don't forget your core reality. You're only going to be saved from the plagues, by the way, the 10 plagues representing violation of the law of God, because you did not hide in a blood-soaked chamber. You're guilty. You can do nothing to save yourselves other than hide, abide, and reside in a building where there's blood on the doorposts, right? So be on a journey, you guys. Deal with the realities of yourself because if we are just stagnant and we're nicely washed like the woman in the Song of Solomon, she didn't want to get up from her bed. It says, behold, the judge stood at the door and knocked. Is that interesting? This is Laodicea. The Laodicea, this is where Laodicea, this whole message comes from, is the whole get up from your bed. It's a very, what's, what's the thing about a bed that's very convenient to you? Oh, man, isn't bed great? Sleep there until one in the afternoon and, right? What, what is it about a bed, right? Especially in ancient times, it, they refer to the bed quite a bit. It's the place where you were born. It's the place where your the smells of mom are and mm, the bed. It's all comfortable and familiar, and you're in your own juices. If if, if you start to miss yourself, you just lift your arm and smell your pits. Okay. <laughs> well, that's the point. You need to smell it. You need to feel what I'm talking about. Super secure. It's comfortable. It's all familiar to you. It's a place where you abide and hide and reside in your own self. Even Job says, I want to I want to make my bed with the maggots. I don't care. Cover me. I just want to be comforted. Right? So be on the journey. Is being a Christian a journey? Is it when you're on a journey, is it comfortable and convenient all the time? I remember trying to sleep on trains in Europe. It's horrible. You have loud drunks, trains, seats don't hardly go back at all. Kids screaming. 
it just when you're on a journey, it's not like the easiest situation. Yeah. It's you're, not home. You're out of your bed. You're out of your bed. And it says, and you are unclean. You're dealing with the dead. So yeah, all right, does that does this make sense? Yeah. All right, so let's go on to Job chapter three, verses twenty to twenty-three. And Paige can read, but if anyone else feels like reading, feel like you can. There, there's a yeah, blessing reading. Do you like reading? I don't mind. I miss so much. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Please do. Job, chapter three. And I highly recommend everyone to read when Job speaks. Just find the Job sections. You will see a foretaste of Christ on Calvary's cross. So, yeah, check this out. Does God give you light to see yourself? You'll see it in the book of James. Does God put a mirror in front of you and you go, oh, no. Oh, no. Right? So Job chapter 3, verses 20 to 23. Chapter 3, verses 20 to 23. And so what you're going to see here is God has a purpose of showing you things about yourself, and it is a bitter experience. But there is liver reasons for it, right? <laughs> There's detoxifying. There's stimulation of your circulation that wasn't there before. Go ahead. Job chapter three, verses 20, 23. Anybody? Go ahead, Paige. Why is light given to him who is in misery hmm? and life to the bitter of soul? Who long for death, but it does not come and search for it more than hidden treasures. Who rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they can find the grave. Why is the light given to a man whose way is hidden, and whom God has hedged in. Whom God has hedged in is the word for sealed. God seals you by showing you things that you don't want to see about yourself. Are you ready for this? And it causes you to hide, reside, and abide in a blood-soaked building. Right? Eat your bitter herbs. Be in the building. Don't go outside. Blood on the doorposts. Plagues are falling. There's only one place to hide when God shows you, when he gives you light. It says, why is light given to him who is in misery and life to what? The bitter of soul, the bitters, who long for death, but it does not come. Search for it then more than hidden treasures who rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they could find the grave. Why is light given to a man whose way is hidden and whom God has hedged in? Because there's a purpose for it. Look at this. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Remember, this is who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. The king that had it all. Solomon. The richest man in the world. Wisest man in the world. Most influential. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Verses 1 to 6. And you're going to be... Because remember, they would put myrrh in the ointment. Right? So when you see the concept of ointment and Mary in the alabaster box... Why is myrrh in there? It's an essential ointment that is sweet to God. And it causes prayers to ascend upward, right? Doesn't challenges, problems, bitterness of soul, doesn't it cause you to pray? Nothing else. Well, a lot of times we never pray when things are going good, right? Just found a wallet with $2,000 in it. I'm going to buy me a da, 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 da. I mean, there might be a like, thanks, Lord. Right. Off to Costco we go. Bless you. But man, is it like something when like everything's gone wrong. Everything, everything you touch. Man, the Bible says you lean your hand against the wall and a serpent comes out and bites it. There's no place to go. Everything is bitter. Everything is bad. All of a sudden, <laughs> God, <laughs> I haven't prayed to you in such a long time. All right, Ecclesiastes chapter 7. One through six. Go for it. A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of one's birth. Better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all man, men, and the living will take it to heart. Real quick. Is that weird? She just read this ointment thing, right? The day of death is better than the day of one's birth. It's better to go to the house of bitterness, of mourning, myrrh, then to the house of feasting and hilarity and celebration? Really? 
For that is the end of all men, and the living take it to heart. Go ahead, verse 3. Sorrow is better than laughter. Huh? For by a sad countenance, sad countenance the heart is made better. Made better. What do some of your translations say? There might be some other translations. Made better? Made glad. For by a sad countenance, the heart is made glad. Now, it's, it's interesting. I'll give you a hint. In the book of James, that we're going to be coming up to it here real quick, there is a reason to count it all joy when you fall into various trials that bitter your soul. See, happiness and joy are completely two separate things. We'll see this. Go ahead. Keep reading. Verse 4. Okay. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. Why, why is the house of fools? What is <laughs> Everything is dismissed, light, nothing touches you. <laughs> Laugh it all off, right? Everything's ridiculous, dismissed. Go ahead. It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise Ooh. than for a man to hear the song of fools. Wow. Go ahead, verse six. Well, like the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. This is also this also is vanity. Wow. This cackling, silly, dismissive, nothing touches me. It destroys your assimilation of what is important. The wise person will let the bitters do its work. Isn't that right? Yeah, pride. Dis fool. Yeah, it, but as a fool, what is the fool in the Bible? What is the idea of a fool? Somebody that doesn't believe that in God. Right. Well, somebody that knows the word and refuses to believe. It's interesting when Jesus says to the Pharisees, when you say thou fool, right? He's warning them not to call them a fool. Not say that you can't call anyone a fool, but you have to understand a fool is an adokimos. Some just given over to their own destruction. They don't care anymore. Doesn't, doesn't, I don't care. They're nihilists. They're giving themselves over to their own destruction. See what I'm saying? They have completely handed themselves over to their insanity. They've given up. They decide to run for the electric fence in the concentration camp, laughing the whole way. They're going to grab anyone they can to jump off the cliff. Think, Thelma and Louise. I think like she was saying about that guy that um, it's that uh, it's the turn of book, that he, he wasn't worthy that the things he did in his life that there's no way that God would accept him yeah. Yeah, yeah. again. Yeah. And I think that's a lot of people's stuff where God doesn't care. As long as you, Turn to him. Yeah, he wants you to come back. Is God faithful? But see, the problem is like that only sounds like a weak person. What if a narcissist think of someone who's faithful and long suffering and gracious and merciful and kind hearted and tender hearted? They're just like, you're weak. I don't need you. It's the opposite. Okay. Go ahead and read page verses 8 to 10 of Ecclesiastes 7. <laughs> or that's okay. Uh, is anyone else there in Ecclesiastes 7? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Zach. The end of a thing is better than its beginning. Ooh. The patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Mm -hmm. Do not hasten in your spirit to be angry, for anger rests in the bosom of fools. Why? How is a fool's, like, why is anger always in the bosom of fools? Why? What's the anger for? I mean, James talks about it, too. It says that uh, uh, anger does not produce, the wrath of man does not produce the righteous fruit of peaceableness that is in the heart of God's people. It doesn't produce that, that personal kind of piety that should be in your life. What is anger? It's a secondary emotion. Mm -hmm. Primary emotion is insecurity, fear, lack of control, helplessness, hopelessness. Anger is a form of trying to get everything back in your control again, right? Is that true? Mm -hmm. To assert your, your power in like you've gone to DEFCON 4. So, verse 10 says this, Zach. Do not say. Why were the former days better than these? But you do not inquire wisely concerning this. Now, I left that verse in for a very interesting reason. That's a part of the theme of this thought. When you're going back, hey, the days were better. Well, God brings in bad days for a reason. Things are going bad for a reason nowadays, whether we get a hold of that or not. 
God is allowing certain things to happen. Don't hold on to it. Don't cling. He's bringing us to the valley of the shadow of death. We're moving into the bitter herbs. For cleansing reasons, we have to be aware of it. Who believes? And maybe there are some dark spots in our soul that we're not aware of yet, possibly. And God's going to have to reveal certain things to us. Okay, let's go on. Let's deal with James chapter 4, verses 6 through 10. James 4, 6 through 10. These are interesting verses, aren't they? Yeah. Sometimes we don't know they're in the Bible, but there's reasons for them. Book of James chapter 4, <laughs> verses 6 through 10. Here, right here, actually. It's over here. Right there, James. It's okay if you're getting familiar. This no, is how you do it. These things overlap, so you can't yeah. see one under it. It's okay. Chapter 4. And then who would like to read verses 6 through 10? All right, Paige, you there? Yeah. But he gives me more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Whoa. Hmm. Does God have a problem when you don't feel the need of anything? You're rich in increase of goods. You don't need anything, do you? You're fine. You're proud. You're rich in your own eyes. But what does he do to the humble? He gives. Grace. Wow, I thought grace was for weak people. Go ahead. Anyway, never mind. Verse 7. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Ah, this is God's strategy for resisting Satan. Satan is the one who fuels <laughs> your what? Pride. Your dismissiveness. I don't need God. I'm fine. I have plenty of cocaine. I have tons of serotonin. I'm cool. I'm flying, baby. I'm flying. I don't need none of yous. Right? You guys. guys. You guys. guys. Keep reading. Submit yourselves. Wait, therefore to God, right? Resist the devil and he will do what? Can Satan tempt those whose glory is in the dust and they're humble and they're dependent upon God? He cannot tempt them. He will flee just like he fled from Christ in the wilderness. Go ahead, read verse 8. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Ah, is, pure, is this the purifying? Is this the, see the bitter herbs here? It says, draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands. Mm. Sinners, purify your hearts. Double-minded. God's going to show you that you're double-minded. What is double-minded? What does double-minded even mean? Because you'll see that. Uh, like you're doing one thing at once, but then you're still believing anything. Yeah, you're kind of, you're flip-flopping all the time. Yeah. You're flip-flopping, right? Mm -hmm. Your one foot is here, one foot is there. You say you love the Lord, but then... Yeah, yeah. You say you trust the Lord, but then. Yeah, yeah. Whatever's convenient. Well, it's not convenient to trust the Lord right now. Therefore, but I'll get back to you, big guy. The big guy upstairs. Huh? Yeah. It's just like the church. Yeah, there you go. You cannot have one foot of Gog and the other foot Magog. I mean, uh, uh, Mammon. The word Mammon is where you get the word like like a breast, like mammogram, like mom or, or, uh, what they call this, you know, uh, like, uh, when you have your breast removed, what do they call that? Mastectomy. Mastectomy. Right here is, it's, it's, it's the bosom of something else. You cannot be at God's bosom and be on the bosom of something else. That's what mammon means. So go ahead, <clears throat> cleanse your hands, what you do. You sinners, purify your hearts, you double-minded. Verse 9 says what? Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. I'm sorry, I didn't show this in the video, so I want everyone to see this. So what is he saying here? He's saying, verse, if you go back to uh, uh, verse 9, like she said, be what? Afflicted? Be, what did you say? Yeah. Be in pain? Yeah, receive the bitters and mourn and weep and let your what? Laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble your hearts in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. The problem is this bizarre kind of form of pride lifts 
us up. The Lord doesn't lift us up. We're lifted up on our own by our own narratives, right? Our own kind of um, delusional kind of narratives. Go to Luke chapter 12. So is this dangerous is the great question. Go to Luke chapter 12, verses 19 to 21. Luke 12. And then verses 19 to 21. So like we're dealing with the wise and the foolish. You guys notice that, the theme here? And so God is telling the church at Smyrna, you're wise, but great bitterness has come upon you. You're there's no negative things God's saying about the Smyrna church, just like Philadelphia. Remember, that's its sister church on the seven branch candlestick. No negative comments coming from God other than hang in there. Remember, Smyrna is the people that are going to die before the coming of the Lord. Philadelphia are going to be alive. And he's saying, listen, you're taking bitter herbs, but it's not to destroy you. It's to purify you, to cleanse you. Luke chapter 12, verses 19 to 21. Who's there? All right, Paige, go for it. Verses 19 to 21. And I will say to my soul. To who? To what? To who? Your soul. Your own self, right? Is this an internal narrative that you talk to yourself? Self. I'm going to say to self. What? So you may have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Ooh, the old eat, drink, and be merry. Good advice or bad advice? All right, verse 20. But God said to him, fool. What? Fool. Uh, wise? Fool. Fool. Okay, go ahead. This night your soul will be required of you. Then those will, then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Wow. What do you guys think of that? Remember this guy, the parable of this guy? Yeah. He had a great harvest. Everything was rocking. I mean, his life was rolling, baby. So he decides to build the barn, store up a bunch of stuff, and then chill out. He kicked his feet up on the table and says, cotton is high and the fish are jumping, baby. And he's loving it. Eat, drink, and be merry. I'm good. Man, You, David, King David had that problem, right? The one time he did not go out to war. The one time he didn't go out to war and he stayed back with the women. And he's there getting his pedicure and getting his manicure and trying on new robes. He's at, you know, he's there in Rodeo Drive, you know, just checking out, you know, the shops. And he's in his Lamborghini and he's got the top down. And all of a sudden, all the guys are at war. David's chilling, man. Hey, I've been to war a million times. I have nothing to prove here, man. I've been to war. I've had my 10,000s and Saul had his hundreds. <laughs> no, I'm cool. I'm staying back with the ladies. Was that a good thing? David, who was at war, David, who was being chased by Saul, when he was eating those bitter herbs, was his heart pure before God? He was on a journey. He saw himself as defiled, but he was able to keep the Passover. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Eat those bitter herbs. Be careful when you start eating at the king's table, Daniel and his companions. Be careful. It even says in the book of Proverbs, put your knife to your throat when you're sitting at the king's table. There's deceit there for you. You're going to see yourself as something that you are not. Being around big shots and stuff like that. Oh, I'm <laughs> Blow V8. Blow V8. Puffed up, fool. Your life's required of you. You were in better position when you were in mourning and you understood your weakness, right? Does this make sense? Wow, right? So he who lays up treasure for himself is not rich towards God, rich increase of goods in need of nothing. It's the, it's right. It's, it's the humble that are rich towards God. It's those who need him. James chapter five, we're back to James chapter five, verses one to three. You see the wisdom that God has? He knows the heart of men. He knows the dangers of our pre presumption and our false prescriptions for ourselves. When we think we need sugar, he says, you need bitters. All right, James chapter five, verses one to three. 
All right. Anyone who wants to read? I can read. All right, go ahead, Zach. It says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Wow. Certainly not the picture of being ready before the Lord. Go ahead, verse 3. Your gold and your silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you. Wow. And will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. You've set yourself up to be destroyed. In your kind of puffed up position, and you should have been eating bitters. But you were so filled with yourself, you fool. Your life is required of you now. And all of those things that you propped yourself up with only testify against you. They're mocking you. Ha <laughs> ha, you believed in us. <laughs> you put your stock in Studebaker? In Tucker? Wow, you fool. It's like, a, what was it in one part where he says, do not let any man take your crown? Yeah. That's, that's exactly. It's funny, in verse 3, it says that this gold and silver is a witness against you. They're mocking you. They're laughing at you saying, I cannot believe. I don't know how many people, literally, that I end up spending all this time pouring mm -hmm. myself into trying to do... Um, like really investing into. And even they would say at the end, why would you believe in me? You saw who I was. I treated you like garbage. That's your fault. I was constantly spitting in your face. I was constantly kicking sand in your face. And you stuck around? You're the fool, right? Trick me once, shame on you. Or fool me once. Fool me a second time, what? Shame on, me. Shame on me. What a fool. Anyway, back to our scripture. So let's go and let's see what the problem is with Laodicea of Revelation chapter 3, verses 17 to 20. What is the problem with Laodicea who has nothing good, God says about Laodicea? Not a single thing. Disqualified. The Greek word, what? Dakimas. Go home and shame. You've been handed over to your fate. That's the last thing I would want. Oh, the Same worst thing. words ever. Go home. You're disqualified from the race. I never knew you. Yeah. Chapter 3. Yes. Revelation chapter 3, verses 17 to 20. Whoever. Deb. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And do you not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked? You don't know. You don't know. And you'll see in Romans 7, it is the mirror that God uses to show you that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. But here's the problem. We don't want to be what? Defiled on a journey. We'd rather be at home in bed clean with our feet, not touching anything that makes me feel dirty. And that's what pride does. Makes you feel like a princess or a prince, whatever. Go ahead. Keep reading. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined and fire. Refined, tried, put in the fires, tested, right? Go ahead. That you may be rich and white garden. That the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. You already have shame and nakedness. Remember Adam and Eve in the garden? Remember Jesus says, why did you hide from me? And what do they say? Because we were naked. I, I thought they had clothes on. Didn't they have clothes on? They had a beautiful fig leaf garment. <laughs> yeah, it was an Armani fig leaf suit. <laughs> Well, when they were in the presence of God, you feel naked. All the garments you put on, all the airs you put on, you could put on a nice peacock uniform and you feel naked before God, right? Go ahead, keep reading, finish it up. And anoint your eyes with an eye salve, salve. <laughs> that you may see. 
You see, we need to see something that we're trying to blind. Remember that emperor's clothes? He didn't see that he was naked, and he walked around saying, look at my nice new clothes, and everyone's having to what? Pretend with him. Yeah. Sounds like politics now. Let's all pretend with us. We're all going to pretend now, and you have to participate in the pretending. Oh, boy. Sure. So God is not going to let you walk around pretending you're wearing a suit and you have to make everyone kind of go along with this self-deception, your self-delusion. So he says in verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke. So does God hate you when he exposes you? No. As many as I love. love. Go ahead. Does love rebuke and chasten? Christianity today says no. That means you're evil. You never expose my sins. You affirm me. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Ah, go ahead. Verse 20. Behold. Oh, here we go. Song of Solomon. Go ahead. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Does that not sound like the Passover? Open the door. Let me come in and reside and abide with you and you will be safe. Right? I think it also sounds like the Sabbath day. Yeah. Let me come and reside with you. Open up. The knocking is I will reprove you, chasten you. I'll bring you out of your comfort self-narratives that you're hiding in. It's you're, you're heaping up destruction to yourself with these, quote, riches. James chapter 5, verses 8 through 11. A lot of time, a lot of point, but you're going to see some very familiar things in James five. You're going to see someone standing at the door knocking. You're going to see some interesting, you're going to see Job. You're going to see some pretty crazy things in James. You're going to see about confession of sins. James chapter five, verses eight through 11. So much fun this thing to do. <laughs> you also be patient, establish your hearts. Ah, before you finish the verse, be patient. What does the book of Revelation constantly say? Here are the patience. It's the word endurance. Hupomone is the Greek word, and hupomone means to abide under great pressure. Don't freak out. Don't give up. Don't run away. Don't go into fight or flight. Deal with it. It's not talking about don't be irritated. A lot of people just make this like, you have to not be irritated. Oh, you just lost your salvation. You got mad. No, it's not about that. It's about don't run away. Deal with it. God is putting you under great pressure for a reason, and it is cleansing your soul. Word patience, very bad translation. Endurance under great trial is, is the translation. Deal with it. Remain under it. Don't run away from it. That process is cleansing you. It's giving you insights into parts of yourself that you don't want to see. Those were like the saints under the altar. Yeah. So let's go ahead and read on. Well, hold, yeah, establish your hearts. There you go. Four. Is it essential that we take these bitters before the coming of the Lord? Man, it is essential. It's life and death. We're going to have to see things about ourselves that we don't want to see, but it will save our life. So a lot of times we use ways of comparing ourselves against other people as a way to feel better about ourselves, don't we? In fact, Galatians chapter 5 says, you devour one another as if you're a bunch of cannibals eating trembling, twitching, hot flesh. It's sick. Why are you comparing yourself to one another, you cannibals? So James chapter 5 says in verse 9. Do not grumble against one another, brethren. Lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing in the door. Wow. Rich and increased of goods, the need of nothing, because you're comparing yourself to one another. And I'm sitting at the door knocking. I'm sitting at your door knocking on your door, talking about chasing and rebuking you. Right? Mm -hmm. So, what? What's the prophets? What's the uh, the prophets constantly saying throughout all the scripture? Speaking the heart of Christ. It is the spirit of prophecy. It is the testimony of Jesus. Verse ten. What does it say, Deb? My brother. Of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Wow. 
Because you're having to bear the reproach outside the gate. You're having to be a castaway. You're having to be somebody that is on the outsides. You're on the, you're on the outs. And they dealt with that. They're showing you what repentance looks like. John the Baptist showed you repentance. The prophets showed you repentance. They wept for God's people when they were sitting in the city playing dress up, right? They were, they were saying that we're in the city and they were listening to false teachers and false prophets. What were every single false teacher and false prophet in the Bible doing? Were they telling you of your sins and telling you to repent? No. What were false prophets and false teachers doing? Saying everything's great. Everything's Peace and safety. Out. Don't sweat it. Chill. Acts. Positive. Thank you. Yeah. You're kicking like a chicken, chilling like a villain. Relax. It's all right. Hey, don't worry about it. Yeah. Guys, got it, man. It's cool. Hey, going to Babylon for seven years? No. What would they say? Two years max. Don't sweat it. You'll be on probation. You'll get uh, serve half your sentence. God will, will do a, a light probation. We go right back to our old stuff. God's like, are you serious? <laughs> That's not what's going to happen. So he says, right, be told it's empty or not. Very powerful, right? You have the prophet showing you what real grieving looks like, what real the situation my people were in. They were weeping. They were supplicating. They were praying. They wore animal clothes, saying we're an animal. They're putting dust in their hair, right? They were in sackcloth, mourning what you should be doing. And they were like, no, nah, we don't need it. We're fine. Until the day Babylon showed up, until the day Assyria showed up, until the Syrian king showed up, right? Then all of a sudden, whoa, what's happening here? Lord, Why? All right. Sounds like what's going on today. So go ahead, verse 11. Behold. So did God give Job bitter herbs? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ooh, yeah. Gosh. And did Job see things about himself he did not want to see? Yeah. Yeah. And back to, you know, the finger of God we talked about last night when you're in the pool. When it says that only God can bring the gnats. In other words, show you the sprout of your corruption. Show you the roots of your weakness. Only God can lift up the veil of self-deluding narratives that we use to comfort ourselves and to live in this kind of strange kind of delusional state of cognitive dissonance. In other words, I'm not going to believe what I see about myself because I think I'm a prince and a king and a poet and a, you know, whatever your past lives are that the psychic decides to tell you or we decide to tell ourselves, right? Postmodernism is all about your story, your narrative. So God said to Job, I'm going to show you something that you don't want to see, that even when you do righteousness, you're still a sinner. When you are perfect before me and everyone can see you and admire you, you're still defiled before me. Wow, that's hard to take. That God is pitiful and merciful. That's why you stand before God, because he has a mercy seat and he's provided perfection for you. Amen? Mm -hmm. Righteousness by faith. So, verse 16, read that, Deb. Well, instead of grumbling against one another, comparing yourself against one another, for the disciples to receive the Holy Spirit in the upper room, what did they have to do? 15, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Ah, the bitter herbs is for healing. Mm. Go ahead. The effective and fervent prayer of a righteous man avails. Ah, uh, why is your prayers not heard? James says, because you're double-minded. You know what? You never come under God's prescription. You're always jumping out of the bitter herb portion. And you're never stable in God. So Proverbs chapter 23, verses 5 through 7. You guys mind that we're going through all this? It's a bitter pill. It's a bitter pill. I like this because I'm writing notes in it. And you're, I love it because Paige is really turning into quite the student. I'm really, really appreciating that. It's chapter 3? 23. Proverbs 23. 
and then we'll start verses five through seven. We're going to skip through. I just want to hit some key points because again, it is this idea of be careful of your narratives. Be careful of how you start telling yourself false stories about yourself and the danger that lies therein. And is it working for you? This is going to be the big question of Proverbs 23. Is it working for you, by the way? Mm. Are you overcoming your sin? The temporary fix is that you're using the prop yourself up. Is it working for you? That's the question of Proverbs 23. So start with verses 5 through 7. Paige. Will you set your eyes on that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. Mm. They fly away like an eagle towards heaven. All the way to verse 7. Do not eat the bread of a miser, nor desire his delicacies. Hmm? What's a miser? A greedy person that's always chasing money. Like scourge. Well, yeah, like uh, anyone else that literally uses money as a form of empowerment and that sits and comparing himself to everyone else. It's not enough anymore to be in the millionaire's club, right? Now you have to be in the... <sighs> billionaires club and now they're fighting to see because that's not enough they're going to find who's going to be the first trillionaire <laughs> for as he thinks in his heart so is he eat and drink he says to you but his heart is not with you yeah eat and drink and be merry sure hey he'll send you down the path that will destroy you you think he's your friend you think he's trying to help you he's there to turn you into a fool and compare himself to you and you want to be like him. You think it's a big privilege to sit at his table. He's only eating you alive with his eyeballs. Right? Go ahead, verse. <laughs> Eat, drink, and be merry. Verse 13. Go ahead, page 13 and 14. Mm -hmm. Do not withhold correction from a child. Ooh. For if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. I'm dying, God. Stop hitting me. Verse 14. You shall beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell. Ah. Sometimes, God, thy rod and thy staff comforts me. Because even though I didn't like the correction at the time, right? But what? But what did it produce? In the end, In the end he's saving your soul from the lake of fire. Wow, thank you, God. In my foolishness, I was like an untethered ox headed straight for my slaughter. A fatted calf thinking, oh, they're inviting me to a party? Yeah, it's a party and you are for dinner. I feel that. That was the last, that was a snapshot that they put the still on this. You gotta make memes if you were something. Why'd you like that one so much, Zach? I feel, I you feel like yeah. a cow a lot of times. <laughs> you are the dinner. Like oh, they fatted me up. This is a good thing, right? Well, They're like, come here, cow, cow, cow. We're like, I'm coming, ding, 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 because my belly. If you think about it, that's people today that fatten themselves up. Yeah. All right. So I'm saying that was verses <laughs> 13. Do not wait, withhold saving your soul from hell. Verse 16 through ver just read verse 16. Who would like to read? Yes, my inmost being will rejoice when your lips speak right things. Ah, he's spanking you, giving you bitter herbs, right? Because he loves you. <clears throat> he loves the people he chases. Do you know why? Because you are headed for the dinner party that you think is for you. Oh, you're you're the guest of honor, all right. You're going to have a nice apple in your mouth and being nicely rotated. <laughs> all sweating as you're going around, going, what's going on here? So now we're this is a weird party. Mama told me not to come. <laughs> Some people know the references to that song. All right, Mama told me. What's this strange smell? Open up a window. Let me get some air. <laughs> right? <laughs> All right, verse 19. Hear my son and be wise and guide your heart in the way. Yeah, and keep going to verse 21. I'm sorry. So, like, you got to hear this is what hearing is. Shema means hear the knock at the door, open up, receive it. Let this come inside of your soul. Go ahead. 19 to 21. Do you not mix with the wine givers mm. or gluttonous eaters of meat? For the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty, 
and drowsiness will clothe, will clothe a man with rags. You see how it's just this sense of false sense of enrichment mm. and avoidance and kind of being insulated from the, the sufferings and the pain of this world, the hardships. You're just setting yourself up. There are ordained hardships of God that is a rod of chastening for cleansing and healing. Like for me, my greatest healing came from some of my greatest hardships, and now I'm getting the, the results of that healing. And I thank God, but it was painful to get. Well, it's like you place. said, you look at the prophets. What, what did he do to all the prophets? They went to the lowest, to yeah. take, almost about to take their last breath. Before. All right, now let's see what the payoff is. We're going to read verses 29 to 30. So let me ask you, is it working for you? Is it producing great fruit or great woe? Like Christ was crying out to the Pharisees. Verse 29. Who has, you Who has woe? Okay. Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who linger long at the wine. Those who go in search of mixed wine. What's mixed wine for? Super narcotics. Super avoidance. Super false euphoria. Go ahead. Yeah. Do not look on the wine when it's red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. Ah. At the last, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will utter perverse things. Yeah. Are you living in delusion during all of that? Yeah. Are you telling yourself things that are true or things that are not true? Things that you want to do. Yeah, but they're, they're self-deluded. Go ahead, Zach. Yes, you'll be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea, but like one who lies on the top. Of a, of a mass saying they have struck me but i was not hurt they have beaten me but i did not feel it when shall i awake that i may see another seek another drink yeah you just keep going back to the same old same old same old guess what's not working it's not working and what's interesting it says going back to it again it says that You'll be like the one who lies down the midst of the sea, like the one who's at the top of the mast. I mean, you think you're on top of the world, Ma? You're on top of everything. It says, they struck me. It didn't affect me. The Holy Spirit came and put a rod to me. I didn't feel a thing. I'm numb. I got the harlot's forehead. I'm anesthetized. Nothing impacts me. Is that a good place to be or a bad place to be? And then it says that when you finally wake up again, you come out of this bizarre state of thinking, you go right back to it again, thinking it's going to work for you. But you fool, eat, drink, and be merry. Proverbs 14, verses 11 to 13. Proverbs 14, 11. 13, yeah. So what happens? What is the end of this weird cycle that we don't get off the merry-go-round? Verses 11 to 13 of Proverbs 14. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Paige. You want that one? The house of the wicked will be overthrown, but the tent of the upright will flourish. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Even in laughter, the heart may sorrow, and the end of mirth may be. Yeah, at the end, you find your sorrow, but it's too late. Mm. Your bitterness does come. But there's, it has no benefits for you. You avoided the medicinal pr uh, properties when you needed it. Now the cancer overtook you, right? We'll go a little bit further. Well, we won't go much further. It's too bad. We're, believe it or not, we're not even halfway done with this. I mean, I hate to do a part three, but... Really? You sure? Yeah. All right, let's go a little bit further, then we'll eat. Is that okay? Yeah. All right, let's go to Job again because we. Last is second coming. Yeah, I mean we're yeah, we're supposed to be savoring this stuff, right? Yeah. Smyrna is turning out to be a very interesting church, isn't it? Yeah. Because it's a purging, a cleansing church. Chapter? chapter twenty-seven, Job twenty-seven. We have to kind of go back into what are these things that God's trying to bring into our life that we're avoiding, and it's going to be to our own death, and we'll die as a fool. I'm hoping we're doing this when Jesus comes. Back. Amen. I'd rather be right in the middle of this and have yes, him come. Yeah. Better than being at a Ronnie James Dio concert. 
especially since he's dead now. Now there's going to be some de demon posing as him. <laughs> and I'm sure the conscious will go on. He's probably yeah, he'll be starring with Tupac. Oh, he's dead too. Or are they? Well, let's go. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> Job 27 verses 1 to 6. What? Job 27 verses 1 to 6. You want me? Yeah, if you want to. Moreover, Job continued his discourse and said, As God lives, who has taken away my justice, and the Almighty who has made my soul bitter. Made his soul bitter, right? Bring him to this real bitter place. Go ahead. As long as my breath is in me, and the breath of God in my nostrils, my lips will not speak wickedness, Oof. nor my tongue utter deceit. Wow. In his bitterness. It's interesting how God can cleanse you and even change your narratives in your bitterness. Go ahead, read on. Far be it from me that I should say you are right. Till I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. My righteousness I hold fast and will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me as long as I live. He's now in a place where he's going to realize that this bitter pill that I'm taking is for my good. I'm not going to abandon, jump to my alternatives, be double-minded. I'm going to remain under this hand. I'm going to remember, this is the perseverance of Job. This is the remaining abiding hoopamone of Job. You're seeing it right here. Under bitterness, he's saying there's medicine here and I'm not leaving this position. Wow. Isaiah chapter 38, verses 15 to 17. Isaiah 38. And then verses 15 to 17. Yeah, 15 to 17. Yeah, Isaiah 38, verses 15 through 17. 38. Okay, who wants to read? Deb? What shall I say? He has both spoken to me and he himself has done it. I shall walk carefully all my years in the bitterness of my soul. What does the bitter herbs cause you to do? Walk carefully. carefully. Be careful. You're not just sitting there doing the walk of the drunk. Right? The walk of the inebriated where you just don't feel anything. You're just walking haphazardly. Man, you're going to have to learn how to be tender footed. Walk carefully. Tread lightly. Right? Go ahead. And in all these things is the life of my spirit. Wow. These are powerful verses if you really read them nice and slow. I shall walk carefully in all the years in the bitterness of my soul. Oh, Lord, by these, it says, the thing, uh, by these things men live. But literally the Hebrew, that's supplied. By these is life. This is the way of life. And in all these, it says things, by all of this, this bitterness of soul, this is the life of my spirit. This is what it means to walk in the spirit. Walk in the light as he is in the light. The man of sorrows. Careful walking. Sober. Clear-eyed, clear-minded. Go ahead, verse uh, 17. Wait, yeah. So, so you may restore me, right? And make me live. I'm sorry. That's Indeed. Is that important in the day of atonement that you have all of your sins atoned for? And what's interesting there, you have lovingly delivered my soul from the pit of corruption. You've cast all my sins behind your back. And verse 17 says, if you go back, indeed, it was for my peace. Will you have peace with God knowing that you have unconfessed, undealt with sins in your life when Christ comes in the clouds of glory? Will there be any peace? You will have no peace. That's why you want to have the biggest list of sins. And the like biggest, yeah, and the biggest cup of tears or whatever. Conf bitterness of soul. 
So you have peace when God comes. Okay, Exodus chapter 15. We'll, and then what we'll do is we'll go part. We'll save the rest for um, next week because we're going to get into sweet in the mouth, bitter in the belly, and you're going to really like all this. Yeah. I think this is a perfect taste for yeah. the peak of Sabbath and a Bible study we're trying to grow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is great. Let's do Exodus 15. Yeah. We'll start with verse 22 to 26. Because this is what's interesting is since this is the day of atonement now, God is preparing his people for his return. And he's allowing great bitterness to happen in our lives for the sake of really being ready for him. And on the day of atonement, there's this thing called the affliction, right? Who knows about a not affliction? So what is that affliction? Is God just kind of wanting you to beat yourself up? No. It means what does Anna mean? Or even where you get the word Hanuk or Hanukkah, Hana. That's to do... Uh, or Hannah, the lady Hannah. She Hannah. wept oh, bitterness. Yeah. yeah, remember her? Yeah, yeah, Hannah. There's that bitter experience she went yeah. through as a child. She was barren in the womb. Mm -hmm. And so it's the word to dedicate. God brings us to deep places so we become de devoted and dedicated to him. Mm. To purge out anything that is, because you're going to see here, you know, this whole behold your face, you know, as in a mirror, then you forget these things and what you saw. We're going to get into that next week much deeper because this is the work of God as the Shekinah glory. The closer you come to God, the more you become unraveled, you'll see. The more your soul goes, what is going on here? The more you will see the, the dry rot, the termites. Like my friend says, man, he was looking at my place one time, the the, the cabin. Mm -hmm. And guy was in, it was Mark Drummond. He was uh, inspecting it. And he says, man, if the termites stopped holding hands, your place would fall apart. <laughs> I said, so that's a good illustration of my soul. If the term might stop holding hands, my place would fall apart. You know, the little high, high squeals that would happen from this. Yeah, teeny tiny little hands. Yeah. And that's what God reveals. Man, we're pretty much totally constituted of corruption. God help me, right? Rich and increase of goods have need of nothing. You do not know that you are wretched. Right? Okay. Exodus 15, verses 22 to 26, and we'll finish up here. Okay. Yeah, I'd love for you to read. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Listen to verse 25. Very so interesting. He, called, he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. We're setting ourselves up for next week. What does this tree represent? Mm -hmm. Cross. How the cross? <laughs> Cursed is him who hangs upon a tree. It's actually the picture of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Christ hung there, and guess what? When Christ was hanging upon Calvary's cross, what did you see? Yes, it's both. He is the tree of life. No mistake about that. But what is he showing you more than anything else upon Calvary's tree? The knowledge of both good and evil. You will see evil and good right up there. The evil of man, of Satan, the sins that so crucified and crushed Jesus Christ. You want evil? There it is. You want good? There's good right there. The goodness of God to bear those sins. And it says that he showed him a tree. Then he cast the tree into it. What do waters represent in Revelation chapter 17, verse 15? Humanity. People, multitudes of tongues, nations, right? Did Christ come and bear the sins of the world? Did he cast that tree into the waters? Mm -hmm. And bitter, 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 man, the... The very condemnation that we have because of sin. The indictment that's being read. Bitter. But he made him sweet. Therefore, let's go ahead and keep reading. There he, what? Made a statue and ornaments for them. And there he tested them. He tested them. Gold tested in the fire. Human beings tried and tested through the bitter herbs. Go ahead. And said, if you 
diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you, which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Bitter healed. You see how this works? Is this powerful? And you'll see here why God allows bitter things. Sweet in the mouth, the gospel, bitter in the belly. <laughs> what is that belly? And you'll see in Proverbs and other places when God gets into the inmost places of our soul, places that we have hidden from ourselves. Is it possible to hide things even from yourself? Oh, yeah. People do it all the time in counseling. I've seen it. People have a great ability to hide things from themselves. It's called cognitive dissonance. You're going to refuse to believe the very evidence of yourself right in front of you. I refuse to believe the very thing that is in my face right now. And you have a thousand people telling you to like, nope, not true. Yeah. Yeah. Very selective memory. Defensive. Defensive listening. Selective listening. Cognitive dissonance. What are some of the other things that you do to avoid dealing with the realities of yourself? Drugs, but but anger. anger. Uh, yeah, all these things. La -la yeah, yeah, right. Escapism. What about what does a narcissist do? They redirect everything and blame you. You're the one that did it. You're the one that made me do it. Scapegoating. Yeah. Projection. Oh, it's me. No, it's you. You were the one the whole time. Right? It's a false atonement. You're rolling something that's true about you onto something else. And then you have to project. It's a false atonement. And there's something very intoxicating about, quote, wiping your mouth and saying, what have I done wrong? Dismissiveness. Very, very dangerous on the day of atonement. And there's a lack of understanding the danger in that. Bitter, bitter herbs. But it's important because the gospel is assuring you the whole time Forgiveness is 100% guaranteed to those who confess, who receive the Holy Spirit, exposing the termites that are holding hands in my soul, right? And that it's okay to come to terms with our mortality, our dirt, our dust, that God knows our frame that we are but dust. It says that a smoking flax, what? He won't quench. A bruised reed? Did you know that they had these reeds like the poor? They couldn't afford walking sticks back in ancient Egypt. So they would go to the sea of reeds and cut them down. And they were like bamboo, right? Cheap bamboo. And they'd sell them for like a nickel. And if it was bruised, if you put the slightest weight upon it, it'd just crumble. God says, you guys are just nothing but a bunch of cheap bamboo with bruises. Any weight in the thing just collapses. And what is a smoking flax? What is that a picture of? A smoking what? Wick. So have you ever had a smoking wick just fill the room with smoke? And the idea of smoke from a candle is the idea in Hebrew of pride. It is the CO2. It's the exhaust. It's the carbon. It's like it never stops. It's just smoking. Everyone's like <laughs> choking on anyone coming in with pride and bragging and stuff. It's not a breath of fresh air. It's the opposite, right? Half the time when that happens, You're choking on someone's exhaust fumes. <laughs> They're going to kill themselves in the garage with that stuff. They get the right? I usually say, get it going. Yeah. And so that's it. The idea of pride is literally a smoldering smoke in a bottle and there's no oxygen. Hmm. And so as you see, before you're putting out the candle, right before it goes out, you just see the whole thing go black. And that's the picture of the soul. Be careful. God's giving us bitterness for circulatory, digestive, and stimulation of the glory of God and his mercy, forgiveness, and cleansing. This is important. All right, guys? Was that a good study? Yeah. Thank you, David. That was a great study. Amen. Amen. That was a great, great. Yeah. You got some comments? Neither can I.